Good afternoon. Thank you for coming um, and thank you for the introduction, Peter. So I'm talking about Hannah Shee Skeffington, suffragist and Sinn Féin, and putting the two together because she's often known as a, a leading figure in the fight for votes for women. And I think next year with the centenary of women uh, and the vote will be have a prominent role in that. But her political career, in fact, continued way beyond that until her death in 1946. This is a statue of her in Canturk, County Cork, um, where she was born. It's the only statue um, of her, and I would hope that maybe Dublin might do something in the future. Um, as Peter said... Um, I've published recently her collected writings, and you can see from, from the, um, the, the thickness of it um, that she wrote prolifically. She wrote as, as a, a journalist mainly. She did have some pamphlets, which I'll refer to, but she also had some memoirs that were unpublished. And so on the left, you have um, uh, a typed-up part, of a foreword to her memoirs, and on the right, you have um, very hard to decipher uh, handwritten memoirs. And she was doing this in the last few months of her life. Some of them were typed up and the others weren't. And she says in the memoirs, in her foreword, the idea of writing as a personal record of my life and experiences has been nagging at my conscience for many years but always other things seemed at the time important and urgent, kept me from it, mass meetings, protests, how hoarse and weary we are of protests in Ireland, execution, censorship, prisoners and their dependents, struggling causes in life, in short life's sweet current seemed to tug at me and pull me off. Padre O'Donnell once said, you don't care enough or you just would do it and let everything else go by. And she says, perhaps he's right, I'm more keen on doing things than writing about them, um, and the eternal job of my earning my daily bread, uh, a lot of that was teaching. She didn't have a pension, and so she taught um, up until till very near the end of her life. So th those were some of the sources um, that I have for her, and she stresses in her memoirs the political nature of her background, um, it looks like a very conventional Victorian family when you see the Sheehy family there. You have in the middle um, David Sheehy, his wife Bessie, in, and uh, seated is Father Eugene Sheehy, the brother of David, and then there are the siblings. Hannah on the far right is the uh, oldest uh, of the family. But the uh, Sheehy brothers were Fenian activists. They were active in the Land League. They went to jail several times. Both of them went to study for the priesthood, but studied in Paris, which was much more um, radical and not under the, the throes of a kind of British rule in Ireland that Maynooth was. David didn't, uh, in the end, um, become a priest, but Eugene was known as the Land League priest. He shared a platform with Anna Parnell and was himself... Uh, a, a strong supporter of women's involvement in political life. And Anna says, Hannah says her, her first memory is as a chit of three going to Kilmainham jail with, with her aunt to visit the Land League prisoners as the ladies' Land League took uh, food into them. Um, and she says uh, of, of that time, Fenian, uh, the games that they played as children, her, her father was a mill owner at this time. And later on, he became a member of Parliament um, when Parnell asked him to do so. But she says, as will be guessed, I was brought up in a political household. In our youth, we played at evictions and emergency men. It was hard to cast anyone for the part of bailiff or peeler. <coughs> All wanted to be the evicted family guarding the home. It was an outhouse in the mill against the crowbar and fortified with water, hay forks and other means of defence. So she starts off... Um, from a Fenian background and she also starts off with an interest at looking at women in political life and knows very well what happened to the Ladies' Land League and their suppression by the men. So this is something that has coloured her all through her, her, her young life and also the weapon of the vote, the fact that Catholic emancipation was something uh, very recent in, in, in her own family's history. Um, you can see 
here my Land's League hut is something that she worked on uh, as a school child. So she was very political from a very early age, a very grand Land's League hut indeed. Um, but she, was, she and three of her sisters were unusual. They went to university, as did their two brothers. The brothers were contemporaries of James Joyce, as was Hannah, and Joyce was a frequent visitor to the Sheehy family home. They had moved to Dublin when David Sheehy became a, a member of Parliament. So when Hannah went to university and she was asked if she would sign a petition that was going to the House of Commons one of a number of petitions that had been happening since the 1860s asking for women's right for the vote. She said, I was then an undergraduate and was amazed and disgusted to learn I was classed among criminals, infants and lunatics. In fact, my status as a woman was worse than any of them because uh, men coming out of jail, male infants growing up, etc., would be entitled to the vote. And she became a conscious feminist from that time onwards. She also, when she was at university, met Frank Skeffington. Frank was a northerner, um, born in Cavan, but brought up in, in uh, Dan Patrick by his father, who was a, a school inspector. Um, so little did he think of schools that, in fact, he had his son homeschooled by him. So Frank never went to school with somebody uh, who, who had his own strong personal and political views. And when they met and married, they amalgamated their names. They became the Sheehy Skeffingtons as, uh, um, as an indication of the equality of their relationship. Neither of them wanted to, to uh, go down that patriarchal route. Um, and that's their marriage photo in their... Um, uh, graduation gowns. Um, the, 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 the university education, the degree, was extremely important to Hannah, and her university gowns were something that she actually quite often used. Um, the Votes for Women movement, the, the suffrage movement, had been, had been going on since the 1860s, since the Great Reform Act in Britain, when middle-class men got the vote, and it was that time when women were specifically excluded from the franchise. So there were a number of organisations set up. In fact, we in the North had the first women's suffrage society set up by uh, Isabella Todd, uh, an Ulster Scots woman. Um, and so petitions and drawing room meetings and trying to persuade the rich and powerful men in society had been going on for decades. And in Britain, as I'm sure you know, the Pankhursts finally decided that it was time for action uh, and not simply words, and they formed the Women's Social and Political Union in 1903. Their motto was deeds, not words. And so young people like the Sheehy Skeffingtons and their friends Margaret Cousins and James Cousins were looking at these uh, uh, events with great interest. They were all members of the Irish Women's Suffrage and Local Government Association, which had been set up in Dublin by a Quaker couple, um, the Haslams. Um, but by this stage, they felt that the time spirit had changed and militancy was what was required. James Cousins himself came from Belfast, working class Protestant. He was self-educated, ended up being the secretary to the Lord Mayor of Belfast before moving to Dublin and moving in very bohemian circles, uh, trying to earn a living as a writer and as a poet. So they came together in 1908 to set up the Irish Women's Franchise League and very much a, a nationalist organisation in the sense that they knew that home rule was starting to, to uh, be raised again, was going to be going through the parliamentary process. What they wanted was home rule for Irish women as well as Irish men, as they put it, and militancy if that was going to be a necessary weapon. And Hannah was the chair of the uh, Franchise League always, and that's her seated, seating in the middle in the front row, uh, a very effective chair. When she was in jail or when she was away, um, her comrades found it very difficult uh, to work without her. There was also a, a paper wall of silence, how they put it, in trying to get suffrage activities <laughs> covered in the press in Ireland and in Britain. 
In Britain, um, the WSPU had set up their own paper, Votes for Women, which later became the suffragette. Um, and they wanted to set up a paper in Ireland to show what was happening, not just with the Irish Women's Franchise League, but to cover all the suffrage societies that were dotted around the country, Some, uh, most of them non-militant and uh, women of all religions and backgrounds being part of it. So, in fact, the WSPU, the Pethic Lawrences, who were the treasurers of the British organisation, smuggled money across to Dublin to fund, fund the initial issues of um, the Irish citizens. So there was a strong uh, comradeship and collegiality between the British and the Irish movements. And so the Irish Citizen was formed and it was edited by Frank G. Skeffington and by James Cousins. Both of them were earning uh, livings as, as journalists at this time and they did it deliberately so that their wives would be the ones free to speak out in public. When Hannah first met Frank, he was registrar of University College, but he objected to the unequal role of women within um, higher education, within universities, and had been responsible for a petition going around um, for equality for women within universities, and he was pointed out there was a conflict in his position as registrar and organising opposition to the university authorities, which he said, all right, I, I resign. So from that time onwards, he had a very precarious living as a journalist, and, and in fact, Hannah was the leading uh, breadwinner through uh, her work as a teacher. But their, their title was The Irish Citizen, and in, in itself that's subversive, because what they were were subjects of the Crown in Ireland. They were not citizens, and were not going to be citizens under home rule either. So one starts to think about that title and what it means. It means, I think, a lot more than, than, than people might have thought at the time. But this strap line was, for men and women equally, the rights of citizenship, and from men and women equally, the duties of citizenship. So it is very much um, uh, seen as something that men and women together were in a struggle to have inequality in, in a future nation state where they would all be citizens. And as the Home Rule uh, Bill progressed through Parliament, it was quite obvious it was going to be Home Rule for men and not for women. Women were not included within the terms of the Home Rule Bill. The Irish Parliamentary Party itself, um, although some members of it supported votes for women, when it came to making the choice between keeping a minority Liberal government in power, which is what the role of the Irish Parliamentary Party was uh, under the Asquith Liberal government, or uh, supporting votes for women, they chose Irish independence rather than votes for women. Uh, so women in Ireland came together with a petition to all of the political parties um, and to government to say that when the Home Rule Bill goes through, you must include women's citizenship. That, um, there was a big mass meeting in Dublin in June 1912, and a historic occasion because you had people from a unionist position and a nationalist position. You had the great granddaughters of Daniel O'Connell and various people come in to say, regardless of our political views, we're united on this principle that women should be citizens. Um, so it was an historic uh, moment, and you can see from the Irish citizen, united Irish women, nationalist and unionist, militant and non-militant, the unanimous demand for political freedom and what is the government's answer. And the government's answer was simply to ignore it. Um, Hannah's own father, David Sheehy, never voted in favour of women's suffrage. There was a great split in the family over this issue. And so they decided the time for militancy had come. And so eight women of the Franchise League chose various um, buildings, public buildings in Dublin. Hannah chose... Dublin Castle, as she said, the seat of British rule in Ireland, to smash windows at. Others chose the Customs House, the GPO, etc. So the first militant activities um, by Irish activists in the GPO actually was in June 1912, four years before uh, the Easter Rising. 
And so those eight women were given prison sentences. Four of them were given two-month sentences, the other four six months, depending on how many window panes they had managed to smash. And again, the Irish citizen gave them great coverage. Uh, Suffrage is often equated with going on hunger strike. These prisoners didn't go on hunger strike when they went to jail because the Irish authorities were very amenable to treating them as political prisoners, unlike (coughs) the situation of women in England. What happened was that the Pankhurst organisation, the Women's Social and Political Union, as part of their policy of following all government ministers wherever they went, Asquith at this stage came to Dublin as part of a a move to assure the Irish population that the Liberal government uh, was 100% behind the Home Rule movement. Three members of the WSPU followed Asquith to Dublin and then engaged in WSPU-type militancy, which was very different from the Irish. The Irish uh, maintained a focus on public buildings. The WSPU had gone way beyond that and, and... also attacked individuals. So they threw a hatchet at the carriage at which um, Asquith and Redmond were were, um, travelling, and they also tried to burn down the Theatre Royal. It caused huge consternation, as you can imagine, in the Dublin streets. Suffragettes were having, uh, Irish suffragettes were having protest meetings in public and found that they were then attacked by the, particularly by the AOH, who tried to throw women into the Liffey, etc. And it became, in that summer, almost impossible for women to have um, public meetings uh, because the AOH, or as Frank G. Skeffington called them, the Ancient Order of Hooligans, attacked women all the time. James Connolly came down from Belfast to support open-air meetings, and even he found that he and Frank Skeffington had to hide in Dublin Zoo when they were trying to have a a meeting in in Phoenix Park. So the women did go on hunger strike because they were afraid the English women were going to be forcibly fed. The English women were on hunger strike, and there were all these smuggled letters between Hannah and Frank as to what they should do in solidarity. So finally, the four... Hannah included, who had smaller sentences, went on hunger strike. As a mark, saying, we support um, our English sisters. Um, And that's Hannah as she comes out of jail after the hunger strike. And Father Eugene, very significantly, is standing beside her, as well as her husband, Frank. Father Eugene always supported her her activities. And that's just another uh, photograph of her outside Mountjoy Jail while another suffrage prisoner is in jail and speaking from a megaphone. Altogether, there were um, 35 suffrage (coughs) convictions in Ireland, not as many as 35 prisoners because some, like Hannah, uh, had more than one prison sentence. But between um, the years 1912 to 1914, suffrage militancy was a considerable um, issue within uh, political life in Ireland. (coughs) I'm going to skip then between that to Easter 1916. When the First World War broke out in 1914, um, the She Skeffingtons and the Franchise League were anti-war. The first poster Frank put up was <coughs> Votes for Women, Damn Your War. And Hannah was very much anti-war. She talked about preaching peace, sanity and suffrage. She and some of her comrades had tried to go to The Hague in 1915 to be part of a a women's uh, peace uh, congress there, which women from 14 nations went to, and they hoped that they would, through a process of mediation and dialogue, be able to persuade the belligerent nations to agree to mediation and stop the fighting. What happened was the British government closed the North Sea to shipping, And the women were left in London, not able to... uh, They weren't uh, given passports to travel either, and the the ships couldn't travel. So they came back to Ireland and had a a protest meeting in Dublin to protest against the British government's uh, refusal to allow them to The Hague. And it's very interesting that at that protest meeting, Patrick Pearce sent a message of support. He said the present incident... (coughs) should um, 
bring women onto the nationalist side. Meg Connery from the Franchise League, chairing the meeting, said this was a total masculine inversion. The incident should be bringing the men onto the women's side. But so there was started that debate, and Thomas McDonough was um, somebody who seconded the resolution of protest. So, and he talked about his role as a director of training with the Irish volunteers at that time, and was extraordinarily um, vocal about it. He talked about how he was teaching the men under him to bayonet um, uh, their fellow men. He said, nobody likes this. I certainly don't like it, but this is what we have to do to achieve freedom. So this was in May 1915. Um, the Irish volunteers by this stage were extremely vocal in what they were doing, but there was also that kind of dialogue between feminists, or some of the feminists, and republicans at that time. Come and Amman, the Women's Nationalist Organisation, you can see their, their, um, their badge, their logo there, was formed in 1914. Hannah and her colleagues didn't join Come and Amman because they felt it had a subordinate status to the men. Hannah, in fact, was extremely vocal about this. She called them animated collecting boxes because their role was to collect money for the men to spend, to learn first aid and to learn um, drilling, but they weren't given a, a seat on the volunteer executive and neither would the Irish volunteers declare whether or not they favoured votes for women if they did manage to achieve an independent Ireland. Thomas Macdonald was a strong supporter of women's suffrage, but could only speak in a personal capacity when he was asked that. Um, they were afraid of splitting the movement and therefore wouldn't come out and speak about it. That's some of the women who did take part in the Easter Rising. And what's, what's significant is when the Rising took place, um, the day after it had started, well, the day be, before it had started, Hannah met James Connolly, who was a close friend of hers and of Frank Skeffington's. In fact, Connolly wanted uh, Skeffington to be his literary executor when, he knew, when Connolly knew he was about to be executed. But Connolly said to Hannah, if you're interested in events, I advise you not to go away for Easter. He then said to her that there was a proclamation that would give equality to women and that if the rising was prolonged for any period of time, there would be a civil uh, provisional government formed and she had a seat in it. So she was obviously held in high esteem by the Republican leadership and if the rising had uh, continued for any length of time. It would have been Hannah Shee Skeffington who would have been the first woman in an Irish government. So, you know, I think that's an indication of the the level of support for women's suffrage that was um, there by with the Irish Republican movement. Tom Clark said to Kathleen Clark as well before the rising that women had been given the vote in the proclamation and only one objected and he was brought round. So there's lots of discussion as to who that might have been, but I think it was Sean McDermott. I can't think that it would have been anyone else. And it was historic, and Hannah, from this time, she went to the GPO on the second day of the Rising with supplies. Um, she and Frank both went to the GPO. Winifred Carney, in her unpublished memoirs, says that she saw the She Skeffingtons talking to Connolly. They were concerned about the looting that was happening. Hannah then went to the College of Surgeons with messages, and Constance Markovich wrote about seeing somebody coming along with a big sack of, of, of food, and then she realised it was Hannah She Skeffington, and she said the Skeffingtons always did what was right in whatever the circumstance. And Hannah was so surprised that when she went to the GPO, the other person she saw there that she knew was her uncle Eugene, who was a close friend of Tom Clark's. They had been Fenians together, and Eugene was there to, to he said, um, give um, kind of spiritual um, support to, to the uh, insurgents. So when later on, Hannah always made the point that the proclamation was the first time in history that men fighting for freedom voluntarily included women. 
because when she would speak to audiences, she'd say the American War of Independence <clears throat> did not include women. The French uh, Revolution didn't, it had, it, although it had women involved in it, the rights of man meant the rights of man, and, and women were not included within citizenship in France. In fact, they weren't included until after the, um, the Second World War. I'm sure you all know that Frank Skeffington was, was, was killed during the riot scene. He was trying, on that day when he and Hannah were, were, were in the Dublin city centre, he tried to set up a, 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 a civic force to stop the looting and, and couldn't get anyone to join him. And he was on his way home and was stopped at Portobello by Captain Bo Bowen Coldhurst, arrested and brought to Portobello Barracks, later on brought out as a hostage with his hands behind him and dragged around the streets as Bowen Coltus went on a rampage. So he was a, a witness to what was happening. Two other journalists were uh, also arrested who happened to be unionist. They were brought back to Portobello Barracks and shot dead that night. Their bodies buried in the barracks, but um, their relatives not told of what had happened. And so that's a photo of, of Hannah with her, hus with her sister Mary Kettle, um, very grim looking um, for news of what had happened to Frank. That's the Votes for Women badge that Frank was wearing when he was arrested and which was finally recovered from his dead body. And last year with the um, centenary of the Easter Rising, um, the National Museum of Ireland, um, as part of their exhibits, showed the brick with the bullets that had killed Sheehy Skeffington. What had happened was that um, Bowen Coltus got some bricklayers who'd been working nearby to come and re-brick uh, the, the, the barracks wall in order to hide the evidence. And the bricklayer took the brick and didn't know what to do with it. So it was only in the 1930s he gave it to Hannah, who felt it should be given to the nation. So she gave it to the National Museum, who I don't think had had it on... Uh, public display until then. So Hannah decided, um, as the campaigner that she was, that she needed um, to find out the truth of what had happened to Sheehy Skeffington. She was helped in this by Sir Francis Vane, a British soldier who had been stationed in Rathmines during the Rising. When Vane tried to help her, he was in fact dismissed from the army. There was a, a, a court-martial of Bowen Coldhurst, which she attended along with Father Eugene and other people. Um, and he was dis he was, uh, the verdict was he was guilty but insane. He was sent to Broadmoor but released very, very soon after that. She felt that the, the, the news, everything uh, had not been uh, uncovered by the court-martial. So she finally, in July... Uh, went to London and had uh, an audience with Prime Minister Asquith, who offered her £10,000 compensation money, which is about a quarter million, I think, in today's currency. And he said that he would organise an inquiry. And I think if you think about that, and given our own knowledge of legacy and how long it takes to have anything happen, she managed to have um, an inquiry into She Skeffington's murder uh, within months and, and the, the meeting with the Prime Ministers. But the inquiry, however, didn't recall Bowen Coldhurst as a witness, so she always felt it was unsatisfactory, but it did um, uncover a huge amount of evidence of what had happened in Dublin at that time. But she decided that that wasn't enough. She wanted to tell the world what had happened in the Easter Rising uh, in, broadly, <coughs> But of course, it was the First World War, um, there was censorship, there was the Defence of the Realm Act, um, and it was difficult for news to come out, so she decided she was going to go to America. It's a memorial card for Frank. But she, so she decided she would go to America. She wanted, she said, to tell the truth. She said a friend said, truth in wartime, that's impossible. She said, I soon discovered the truth of that saying. She couldn't get a passport to go to America unless she promised not to discuss Ireland, Britain or any of the events, even in private conversation. 
Uh, so she said as well as that, anyone who had got a passport by the British were then were considered suspect because it was felt that they were exceeding to British demand. So she finally, like many others, uh, went to Scotland and got a false passport and smuggled herself and her son Owen to America. They arrived there in December 1916. She has a, uh, a speech that she, she gave, and it was called British Imperialism as I Have Known It, and then she had it published, British Imperialism in Ireland, um, in five, um, she had five different uh, publications of it, the last one just uh, before her death. And she, in it, she, she, she talked about the rising, and she talked about uh, what had happened to Frank. She's, this is part of what she said. I knew the Irish Republican leaders and I'm proud to call Connolly, Pierce, McDonough, Plunkett, O'Reilly and others friends, proud to have known them and had their friendship. They fought a clean fight against terrible odds and terrible was the price they had to pay. She talked about the equal citizenship of women, etc. But what she also did, and this is why she was so important in the 18 months she was in America, was that she, uh, her emphasis was what... America should should support by the time the war came to an end. And this was really urgent because nobody knew how much longer the Great War was going to go on. It had already gone on for two years. Nobody knew it would go on for another two. And so she would say, we look to the United States particularly to help us in this matter. The question of Ireland is not, as suggested by England, a domestic matter. It's an international one, just as the case of Belgium, Serbia and other small nationalities is. We want our case to come up at the peace conference to the International Tribunal for Settlement, and that's what she emphasised in speech after speech throughout um, America while she was there. And, And, you know, if that had happened, I think, you know, we could maybe argue that it would have led to a lot less bloodshed in the future if, if, if Ireland had been able to come. But America joined the, uh, the British war effort in April 1917, and it made it a lot more difficult um, to argue the case because uh, America was now an ally of Britain. Nevertheless, uh, Hannah managed to have a, an interview with President Wilson. She was the only Irish Republican to be able to do that. Nora Connolly O'Brien, Margaret Skinner, Liam Mellows, Patrick McCartan, a whole host of well-known figures were in America at this time, also going round on propaganda tours. But she was the one who managed to, to get the interview. And as she said, I was the first Irish exile and the first Sinn Féinor to enter the White House and the first to wear the, the, bed, the badge of the Irish Republic, which I took care of to pin in my coat before I went. So for the first time, she called herself a Sinn Féinir. Um, and I think that, 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 that's significant as well. People like Liam Mellows were told to, to stick to the Irish-American community, but Hannah was much wider, much broader in who she met while she was in America. For example, she was invited to be a member of the Heterodoxy Club in New York, women like uh, Emma Goldman, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, a whole host of radicals from anarchist, socialist, feminist were part of it and you had to have stepped outside convention to be a member and it was one of her proud boasts to be a member of the heterodoxy. But she also um, spoke on behalf of Tom Mooney. Tom Mooney was a member of the International uh, Workers of the World, the Wobblies. This is only two years after the execution of Joe Hill he, uh, uh, Mooney was arrested and was under sentence of death as well, even though President Wilson himself did not think Mooney um, guilty. When she went to San Francisco, her meetings were um, the halls that they had booked. She wasn't allowed to have them, had to have open-air meetings. She was also arrested for a time, but continued. And in fact, when she went back to America and other times, uh, uh, went and visited Tom Mooney He stayed in jail for 23 years. He was only released at the time of the Second World War. But she came back uh, to Ireland in 1918, travelling on a ship with Nora Connolly O'Brien and Margaret Skinner. She felt she'd been there for 18 months, had spoken at over 250 (laughs) meetings, and came back in time for the historic elections of 1918. 
and Constance Markiewicz was very much active in the campaign to have Markiewicz elected. And the feminists of the Franchise League and the women of the Common Man joined together on that and were very critical of Sinn Féin, who they didn't feel had taken the campaign seriously. We also had another Sinn Féin candidate in Belfast, Winifred Carney, who had also been in the Easter Rising, had been in the GPO all the time working with Connolly, unsuccessful in East Belfast. But the Irish Citizen paper was still active when Hannah was in America. Louis Bennett, um, a non-militant suffragist, had kept it going. When Hannah came back, she and Louis Bennett uh, worked on it together. And they think this is very much written by Hannah. Ireland proudly writes progress on her banner to show the world how much in advance she is of those who would rule her. And now it's Dublin that returns the first woman member of Parliament. Bravo, Dublin. Hail to thee, Constance, in thy cell, a little quote from the poem by A.E. But um, one, of the, one of the issues about that is, well, first of all, it's interesting whether or not um, uh, Theresa May will recognise Constance Markovich on, on, on becoming the first woman member of parliament uh, when we come to next year. But Hannah herself wanted to be a candidate, and the only... Um, constituency she was offered was North Antrim and she was told no it isn't a winnable constituency so she refused to take it and was quite insulted <coughs> so there were, it was very difficult for Sinn Féin women Kathleen Clark also wanted to be a candidate and then she discovered she said that the machinations of Harry Boland meant that a man was put in 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 the Place. So women were quite disgruntled that there hadn't been enough done to support women and they formed their own League of Women Delegates trying to press Sinn Féin to have reserved seats for women uh, and to support women uh, within the elections. So Hannah, when she came back from America, all organisations asked her to um, join in the She's She's Geffington material in the National Library. You can see that the Labour Party wants her to join. Kamala Man would like her to join. She says she joined Sinn Féin because she could see that was where the action was. That was the, the forward part uh, of the political movement at the time. And she very quickly became an executive member. This is a, a photo from 1922, and she's there on the far right beside Harry Boland, and it's interesting to see Michael Collins, how much he stretches himself out uh, to have Valera as, you know, like this. But Hannah just does not look particularly comfortable, I think, by then, as a member of Sinn Féin. And in her memoirs, she's very interesting, the little things she does say about people. She says of Collins that he had the military man's contempt for civilians, and they did have a very uneasy relationship um, uh, working relationship. She talked a lot about his boisterous nature and uh, his love of, you know, uh, wrestling and his choice use of language, etc. Um, you have other women there, Mary McSweeney, Kathleen Clark and Kathleen Lynn. But um, although she's there, Sinn Féin is the, the political organisation. She's the director of organisation. She also continually talks about the importance of putting women forward. And you can see that in, in, in her reports. The um, person that she um, was close to that one often doesn't realise it is Constance Markovich. They lived around the corner from each other in Dublin in the suffrage days. Although Markovich never joined the suffrage movement, um, she always felt national independence was the thing that had to be fought for, first of all. Once the um, Easter Rising had happened, or um, th there wasn't anything to keep them separate in terms of what the priorities were. And they became extremely close comrades. Um, so much so that when Markovich died in 1927, Hannah was the one who was very much at the forefront of keeping Markovich's memory alive. Hannah was the one who was appointed executor of Markovich's estate as well. There's kind of interesting parallels between Frank Scaffington and Connolly and, and Hannah and Constance Markovich. Hannah, by this stage, was earning her living mainly as a journalist and a journalist for the Irish world, which is a... Uh, an Irish-American paper, and 
it, it's, I think, an essential source of information for historians of this time. She becomes a journalist in 1924 and stays with the Irish world until about 1929, when, when she, she breaks politically uh, w- with them. But she, she looks all at the time at the Free State and what's happening in the Free State and has a really acute eye for how power is consolidated by the Kamenegel government and what is happening and how the how ceremony is brought in and crept in and privilege comes in. I think it's a really important source that isn't used um, and, and I feel very strongly that it should be. But when Constance dies prematurely um, at the age of 59, she has a very moving tribute to her in the Irish world and... It's the same time as Kevin O'Higgins is assassinated. She also has very, very bitter words to talk about the state funeral of Kevin O'Higgins um, and the fact that the state would not allow uh, Markovich to rest in any state building. She said even the British allowed a Donovan Rossa uh, somewhere, you know, uh, whereas the, the Kamenegel government didn't. But she talked about by her beer they pressed, kissing the glass that covered her face, so serene, so remote in death, touching the wood of a coffin as a sacred relic. The friends of the poor was their epitaph. I stood there hour after hour and watched them pass, the women with their babies, comrades of 1916, uh, dockers whose family she'd fed in 1913, families whom she'd supplied with turf and timber last winter during the fuel famine, ex-prisoners, relatives of the executed men, in short, Dublin's proletariat, her constituents. And that sense of of growing isolation, I think, uh, is is very symbolic. Um, And the way that women start to be written into the national narrative, because de Valera has an epitaph for Markovich, and it's, it's, you know, Madam, the friends of the poor, she who set aside ease and her station to come with us, but very much as if she was a kind of philanthropist or Lady Bountiful rather than a revolutionary. And over and over again from this time, um, on different uh, occasions, Hannah will write in different journals, whether it's Anne Foblocht or... or um, votes for women, one of the English journals, she'll come back to what Marky, which was, which was a revolutionary and not the kinds of uh, image that, that, that De Valera wanted to portray. So she was very much earning a living as a journalist and these are just a couple of uh, examples of what she, she has. Um, on the left is uh, an article in um, an English feminist paper, and she does this quite a lot. Women in 1933, a review and a stock-taking. Um, she starts off, I don't mean, know the meaning of the word feminist, as John Redmond in 1912, um, and then today the Oxford Dictionary defines feminism, etc. But then what she does is really interesting. You see all the time that she... she analyzes what is happening to women globally. She travels a lot. She goes to international women's congresses in Europe and you can see creeping fascism. She talks about the fact that the Italian women now are not able to go to the Congress, what is happening in Germany, etc. A really interesting kind of checklist always of what happens. And again, she talks there about Constance Markovich, the first woman to be elected, etc., and now there's evidence of a setback to women, especially in countries such as Germany and Italy, etc. And she talks about the rise of the Labour Party in Britain, the numbers of women being elected. There is nothing about her that isn't um, generous and outgoing. She's never anti-British at all in anything she writes, unless it's uh, on, on a political level. But she also has, by this stage, people, her comrades are dying. And so... Um, there are a number of, uh, of, of obituaries that, that come very quick one after the other. And one of them, Emma Goldsman, it's the range of people she knew. Um, even, you know, somebody, an anarchist in, in America, Emma Goldsman, that one wouldn't associate with Hannah Sheehy Skeffington. And she talks about, um, she says, I have beside me a, a journal she inscribed for me, her essays, 
and it says to Hannah Shee Skeffington, I give this volume in the hope that it may help you to see beyond nationalism and women's suffrage, adding a rebel tribute uh, as well. You know, so they didn't necessarily agree politically, but they, they met, every time she went to America, she met Goldsman as well. She was um, barred from the North once, when, when, when she was um, against um, the treaty. Uh, she was part of a, a group of women who um, had lobbied while the treaty debates were on to let women between the ages of 21 and 30 have the vote before the treaty was voted upon. This would, of course, also give a lot of young men the vote if the register had been updated because it was totally out of date. So all of the young generation who had taken the key role in the War of Independence were not there to vote upon the treaty. Arthur Griffith said that if this was done, it would torpedo the treaty, but the Free State um, guaranteed women over 21 would have the vote afterwards. Indeed, they did from 1922 onwards. But she, um, she wasn't part of the military campaign in the Civil War, but she, she felt the treaty... Uh, rewarded the privileged and on class grounds she was very much against the treaty and she was also because she had Skeffington family in the north she was against this crazy patchwork quilt as she called the imposition of the border on Ireland and I think given our Brexit times and our Brexit concerns thinking what it would have been like for them when suddenly a border is imposed um, dividing six counties from the rest and dividing families from each other and she was uh, then an, uh, uh, barred by the northern government from coming um, up north which she did secretly to visit family but then she was asked in 1933 if she would speak on behalf of Republican women in Armagh jail so she came publicly and knew what the consequence would be which was that she was given a month's jail in Armagh and when she was talking about it, uh, when she was asked in court whether she wished to reply to the charge, she said, obviously it was fully proved. I make no denial or apology for having been in County Armagh or any part of the 32 counties. I recognise no partition. I recognise it as no crime to be in my own country. I'd be ashamed of my own name and my murdered husband's name if I did. Um, but... What's interesting, she, and she writes in Anfoblog, by this stage she's left, uh, she's, she has been in Fianna Fáil very briefly, uh, leaves it when they enter the Doyle, and becomes very close to the socialist republicans like Padre O'Donnell and Frank Ryan, and in, in fact edits the Anfoblog at any time that they're in jail. Um, so you can see that when she comes out of jail, she has huge civic receptions in, in Drogheda and Dundalk, and then in, in Dublin as well when she comes back. And a sort of motor cavalcade uh, escorts her back down to Dublin. She remains politically active. The 1930s are a time not only of fascism in Europe, but a time uh, of retrenchment in terms of women's economic and public role. So in Ireland you have the 1935 Conditions of Employment Bill that um, restricts women to la large parts of industry, uh, removes them from those, and then you have the build-up to the 1937 Constitution. In all of this, Hannah and her sister Mary Kettle, for example, who was chair of the Women's Social and Progressive League, that, young, that older generation of women are still active, not so much a younger generation of women, but this older generation of women. Um, and, and they continue. So she hopes that a women's political party will be formed. And she's urging this all in the 1940s, and in fact, she stands for election in 1943. Four women stand as independents. She stands in Dublin South. And she stands, as she said, on a workers' republic uh, platform. Um, and she stands very much for, for James Connolly's conception of a workers' republic. She says, there can be no true democracy where there is not complete economic and political freedom for the entire nation, both men and women, nor can there be effective administration where the political machine is entirely controlled by one sex only. Um, 
and she talks about very much about that under the 1916 proclamation Irish women were given equal citizenship, equal rights and equal opportunities. Subsequent constitutions have filched these or smothered them in mere empty formula. But this is the, the last photo taken of her. She didn't like her photo taken, so she always looked grim. But by this stage, I think you see more of the humour of the woman. She has a fantastic sense of humour. Her writings are extremely humorous. She often uses a sort of a bitter sarcasm to describe her political opponents. Um, as she was ill, she said to her, her son Owen that um, she was an unrepentant pagan and to remember that when she was dying, she said, if I call for a priest, she said, it's because my mind is disturbed. Ignore that. She said, I'm, I'm a pagan. And so he did ignore it. Um, he had said himself about his parents that they thought themselves out of religion. They never got Owen baptised, for example. And the, the last um, writing that she did was for the Irish uh, Housewives Association, Owen's um, French wife, Andre, was co-founder with Hilda Tweedy of the Hi Irish Housewives Association. And when I interviewed Andre, she said she remembers when she came back after they had formed it and told Hannah, and told Hannah what the name was, that Hannah drummed her fingers and said, you're not married to the house, you know. Um, but was asked to write an article for the first edition of their paper. And it, it's, it's a wonderfully... Uh, a humorous article. She talks about um, writing. She talks about the words that are used to define women. She said, like spinster, even though they've maybe never seen a spinning wheel unless it's in a museum, and how women have to live in the inconveniently constructed houses that have been built by, by male architects. But she talks very much about that new generation of women, hoping that they would continue the fight for women's rights and also working class rights because a large part of what the Irish Housewives Association was doing was, was fighting for fairer food at a time of the emergency, at a time of the black market in Dublin. Um, so that's the time when she, when she dies. In the middle of the, the Second World War, her last article appears posthumously, but it has as much of the humour and the fighting spirit that, that she had conveyed throughout the rest of her life. I think she's very much justified and been seen as one of our foremost political leaders, somebody that I hope that the political establishment, at least in the South, will take very seriously next year with the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote. Thank you.